Welcome everybody to Letter Now, a podcast where we nurture the hand lettering masters of tomorrow today. My name is Martina Flor. I'm a lettering artist, author, and educator. And today we are going to talk about career change and freelancing. We will speak about how to overcome the fear of going solo and several topics around freelancing. We will touch on how to create income to provide for yourself and for others if you have a family. And many of you listening might be thinking of going solo or start freelancing. So we might touch on the idea of security that employment provides. Perhaps you are now employed or you have a day job and you're thinking of going solo and you're wondering like, how can I have the same security feeling that I have right now with my job. Um, so we're gonna touch on that as well. And for this, I have a talented lettering artist with me, Belinda Ku. Uh, Belinda is an artist that combines playful letter forms with colorful illustrations. So hello, Belinda. If you'd like to introduce hello, yourself. Hi, thank you for being here today. Um, so did I, did I say that right? Did I define you right? How would you define your work and yourself? Yeah, so I'm Belinda Ko. Um, I am a lettering artist and illustrator based in Chicago. And my work does consist of a lot of colorful, playful, food-inspired art. And I have taken the leap to freelance almost two years ago for my agency job. And since then, I've had the pleasure of working with clients like Adobe, Nespresso, and Coach. And my journey has definitely been very nonlinear. I used to major in biopsychology, which led me to teaching middle school. Excuse me. And then now I am doing, you know, I did graphic design and art direction and now I'm doing freelance. So I'm excited to talk about this career change uh, topic with you today. Yeah. And I think I think that was the like the, the reason why I invited you today, because I saw, um, you know, we had we had a, a conversation on Clubhouse once and by going through your website and understanding a little bit about your journey, I read that you began your journey in biopsychology. And I, I wonder, like, how how did she go from biopsychology into lettering and actually having now a thriving freelance business in lettering um, because you know most of us perhaps pivoted um, their career um, but perhaps they you know personally I narrow down I'm a graphic designer and I narrow down into lettering and typography so within graphic design I went a little bit deeper into a specific topic uh, but it wasn't such a huge career change but in your case was like really like going from one thing to a completely unrelated topic, or perhaps I see it as unrelated, and you see a lot of connections between biopsychology and lettering. So how, how was that experience for you? How was realizing first that you wanted to do something different of what you were already doing? And you know, how was, how was for you the process of facing that truth, you know, to face that, hey, I, I don't, like what I'm doing right now and I will go I would like to go in a completely different direction I would say a lot of uh, most of the points of decision making for me was just a truth of I think I want to draw I am into the creative field and you know I went to pursue biopsychology because I grew up with the mentality with my parents too, that finding something that was more in the sciences or business or law was a much more secure career path than art. And at that time, I didn't know anything about graphic design. So I was thinking more in the mindset of fine arts. So I thought if I like drawing, maybe that's something that I can just keep as a hobby and pursue a career that is more secure <laughs> with quotation marks um, in that you know, respect. And then it wasn't until I graduated with my degree that I realized I don't know if I really love science that much. And I ended up taking a two year commitment to teach middle school science. It was part of a program called Teach for America in the United States. And they place you in lower income and struggling schools to help bring in your expertise from your background, which for me was science, to students. So at that shift, I already felt that maybe I was making a mistake or, you know, like 
I already spent all these years in my college and learning this biopsychology degree. And now I'm kind of applying it to this new job, but it didn't seem completely aligned. So I was a little bit worried about it not being worth the effort. Um, but I found that through the experience of teaching and educating children, um, it helped me to realize one, that science was not my biggest passion. <laughs> Um, and two, I did like education, but maybe it wasn't going to be relating to the sciences. Maybe it could be something else. And then three, mm -hmm. I was much more interested in designing worksheets and creating graphics for my students' class than I was actually <laughs> applying the lesson. Mm. So I thought maybe there was a possibility of graphic design from this. And in the background, I was always doing a little bit of art on the side anyway. So once my commitment was up, I decided to take that first big plunge into graphic design. So that felt like a career change for me. And I was super scared about it. I, you know, called up my friends and asked them, is this a mistake? Am I making too big of a risk? You know, should I just keep doing the art stuff on the side? And because they knew me better than I knew myself, they were all like, yeah, you should go for it. Art has always been your thing. Try it mm. out, you know, try it out as a career. That's So, so that was my first stint. That's so interesting now, like to understand, like to see, to see through others what you, what you're good at, because oftentimes we don't realize like how we really are. We don't see ourselves and others can see us better than, than we actually can. Like I had an, um, a situation with my husband, um, Ilya the other day, like I was, I was, I was doing actually like a breathe ex exercise with, with a group that I'm in right now. And um, we went through an exercise of like doing just breathing and, uh, and experiencing that and experiencing what happens in your body through, um, you know, breathing in, in a specific way. And I was so amazed by the experience, and I and I went um, I went to to tell my husband, hey, I had this experience, was so great, was so amazing. I never thought I was this kind of person who would do something like this, and who would be into that. And then he came back to me and said, like, well, you're totally like that, like you know. And I had a <laughs> totally different perception of how I am. And he said, like, you're totally the type of person who would go like who would be into something like that, right? So. I think it's some, so important from what you just said that um, you actually ask people around you how, you know, how, how they, they will see you, like how they see you from the outside and they, they sort of mirrored something that you didn't even see yourself. And um, it also brings me back to the fact that it is so important to surround yourself with people that actually um, is willing to cheer you on on your new path, right? Because you can also, you could have also met or be surrounded by people who were totally bringing you down on your idea of pivoting careers and telling you like, hey, no, that's not a secure path, you know, with art, you, how are you gonna make money? But you actually encounter people who were like cheering you on, on this new direction in your life, right? Absolutely. I think our imposter syndrome is already loud enough that we don't need real people to iterate the same thing. We definitely want to surround ourselves with people who are supportive and also very honest with you too. You know, if, if you see yourself wanting to pursue a passion, then your friends can either confirm that because they see it in you or they can tell you that's kind of coming out of the blue, Belinda, like, where did that come from? <laughs> so it's nice to have people to double check that. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm making a note on that. Um, and um, as you know, this is a listener driven show. So we are going to go into answering questions from the audience. Um, we will start by answering the voice messages that were sent to us. Um, if you're listening, you can send your voice message uh, memos, with, memos uh, with questions and comments by simply going to martinaflor.com slash voice message, or you can email them um, to, you can email your recordings to podcast at martinaflor.com. So let's listen to the first voice message from Andrea. Hello, Martina. Hello, Belinda. My name is Andrea and I live in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. I work in an ad agency. So my question is, how do you overcome the fear of leaving this steady job for a freelance career? And what are the first steps that I must take to make this happen and not cry in the end of the day? 
I'm a single mom, so it is kind of scary to to take this step, but it's actually the the dream I'm pursuing for so many reasons. So thank you for your message, Andrea. I was I was listening to Andrea's message before our conversation, Belinda, and you know what? When, when I hear her, I um, you know she mentioned that she's a single mom, and I can imagine that the dreams. The dream she's speaking about has to do with, um, you know, having more flexibility in her life. And um, well, can I stay? Can I stay home if my kid is sick? Or uh, you know, I don't have to. You know, if I have this flexibility, I don't have to miss school events. Or um, yeah, I don't have to miss on events or things that happen to my kids because of work. Um, so what if I could have also take longer holidays, for instance? So there's a lot of I can imagine that in her dream, there's a lot of possibilities. So perhaps, Andrea, what I would say um, is that you can start there, right? Like you, you're you already envisioning a sort of life you could have if you will go freelance, right? So you could, you could perhaps focus on that, focus on all the possibilities that are waiting for you if you go freelance. Um, because I feel that we normally focus on the negative side of things, uh, Belinda. I don't know if you agree with me, with me but um, you know we normally focus on what could go wrong, and we sort of miss miss sight of what could go actually great. So, um, and this is what actually stops us from taking that step, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I really resonate with Andrea's uh, last part where you know you were saying. You want to be able to take that lead to freelance, but you don't want to be left at home crying at the end of the day because you're afraid of all the things that might happen. That was a huge thing that was paralyzing me from taking the leap to freelance was just worrying that I was going to fail at it. And I didn't, it took me about three months to realize that that fear of failure was kind of uh, almost too big in my mind. Like I was making failure to be such a big thing when really the failure could have just been worst case scenario I don't get hired by clients. I don't, you know, successfully launch different streams of income and I'm not making enough financially to help with my family. But I didn't remember that what I can do if that happens is I can go back into job searching and figure out a different solution. And that freelance doesn't have to look like a full-time gig. It can also be a side thing too. So uh, that was a big thing for me. Um, and one thing I would also suggest is if you're currently at an agency job, because this was something that I ended up doing um, before I made that complete transition, is I was able to talk to my team at my company to figure out a solution that could work with my family life and offer a little bit more flexibility. So one of the schedules that we ended up doing was me being able to work from home a couple of times a week, which I, I think will change now with the pandemic and everyone working from home. But then the other thing was I was able to come up with an agreement of working just four days a week, still at a full time schedule, but with eight less hours that could buy me time to focus on freelance and also focus on my children before I ended up ultimately taking that leap when I realized I needed more than just eight hours a week for that. But that was also a really uh, nice solution that I personally didn't know until I reached that point and realized I can try to ask my company and see if you know they'd be willing to come up with something where I can pursue a little bit of both my interests and still be an employee there. Yeah, that's interesting because I think the first step is realizing that something doesn't work for you. So I can hear in Andrea's uh, question that she feels that there's something better waiting for her somewhere, right? Like she feels that she needs to change and... Um, and that's, I think it's a big step towards, you know, creating that reality for you, like understanding that there's something that doesn't really work. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be going completely freelance. Like you said, Belinda, maybe you can find a middle step that makes you feel more comfortable and makes you, you know, um, in your context, in your current context of being a single mother and having to provide for your family, um, this middle step makes you feel more comfortable. A, a middle step where you can work two days um, per week at home or you can work four days a week instead of five days a week, right? Try to find, this is about trying to find a scheme where you feel happier, where you feel that you have more control over your time and your life, right? And I think, 
I think it's also a smart move to sort of um, try that if you're scared of like going completely freelance on your with your business to try that first step and see how that works for you. And perhaps you you start feeling um, or experiencing some stuff that make you feel like, hey, this this could really work actually for me. Right. If I you know, you can always go a little bit more. Right. And suddenly you find yourself being absolutely completely freelance um, and you took that step um gradually right you took step by step and then you went from having a, a full-time employment to being full-time freelance right um and i think also something from what you just said belinda um oftentimes we feel that um or I, this is what happened to me actually um i felt I also I had also like a, a full time job for many years, and I always dreamed of like going solo or going freelance, and um, I always felt that there was like either black or, or white, right? Like either I was full employed or I would go freelance and I would be starting over. And actually, what you just mentioned, um, I think for many can be um, eye opening, which is like ask your employer, perhaps they will be happy to have you as a freelance full-time designer, right? Or full-time illustrator. Uh, perhaps they will be, you know, willing to have you working three days a week instead of five days a week. Perhaps they become your first client as a freelance um as a freelance artist, right? Um, so that was also your experience when you went, when you... Uh, became freelance or you went freelance you were also working for your previous employer or how how would that uh, how did that happen for you so when I decided to go full-time freelance it was because I reached that point where even with this new solution with my company I just could not juggle everything and the thing I was losing out on the most was my sleep and I realized I need my sleep to keep going especially with very high energy young kids and um, there was the opportunity for me to work freelance with my employer. So definitely that is something that you can take, um, especially if you're worried about build, you know, keeping that secure financial um, support going. That is something that you can try to talk through with your company. For me, I was taking that leap because I really wanted to just pursue creative fulfillment. And it wasn't something that I was aligned to anymore with what I was doing with my clients and my company. Mm. So I did decide not to do any of that freelance work so that I can focus primarily on lettering and illustration, which is very different from the B2B stuff that I was doing. So um, my first clients included a couple of old coworkers. So former mm. coworkers, I was able to work out something with them. I have one who started this very cool brewery in the suburbs and I got to do some work with her business and then also a couple of connections through my company. That was, you know, stuff that really helped to build up my freelance momentum when I first made that leap. That's such a good takeaway for you, Andrea. Um, I think, um, you know, if you're scared or if, if you're insecure, you feel insecure or you feel it's a, it's a too big of a step right now to go freelance, um, actually looking around and asking the people you already work with or previous, um, you know, employers, like just touch on your network and see what what possibilities are there for you, which possibilities are there for you. So um, instead, and also like something from what we were touching on before, instead of focusing on all everything that could go wrong, right? Like, uh, what if I don't do enough income? What if I fail in my, um, you know, in my freelance business? Try to focus on what is there, you know, what are the things that are waiting for you that are great? Like, what are the possibilities in front of you that you're missing out on? So, Andrea, since you're thinking of going freelance, I want to give you uh, one of my tools um, so that you can understand what are the necessary steps to make it happen in case you want to launch your freelance business. Um, so I have this launch your freelance business to do list. Um, this is um, this is a list I created uh, that will walk you through the steps to finally take the leap um, into uh, a freelance uh, practice, you can go to martinafrodcom slash launch and download it for free. Um, so now we can move on to the second question from Alana. Hi, Martina. This is Alana. 
I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and my question is, have you ever had a goal for your career and you've achieved that goal and it didn't feel the way you thought it would feel after having achieved it? Like, have you ever had these goals and these dreams and then you achieve them and you don't feel the way you think you're supposed to feel? And how did you deal with that? Thanks for taking my question. This is such a profound question, uh, Alana, uh, because, you know, the question is more about, it's not so specific about freelancing or about, um, you know, career pivoting, but it's more about like, you know, the things you want for your life and what happens when you achieve them, right? Um, I know that I have to remind myself to celebrate whenever I achieve a goal. I started doing that when I incorporated other members in my team because I understood that those milestones were important for all of us to feel that, you know, to feel that we were going from A to B um, and to have that sense of like, hey, we made it, you know, let's celebrate. Um But the thing is that I feel that making it or achieving that thing you want to achieve implies, you know, going from A to B implies a lot of small mundane tasks or everyday tasks that are not so important, right? And um, so making it, actually getting there from A to B is just one more you know, one more step in those small tasks, right? It's like, um, you know, it's like, it's like your birthday, right? Your birthday is just like any other day. The thing is that you assign that day and, you know, and a special meaning because you actually say like, hey, today is my birthday. I'm going to celebrate. So I think a lot of, a lot of the value that things have have to do with the value that we assign to them, right? Um, so I would say like, I would personally say like, get a specific about how that goal looks like, you know, that goal you want to achieve looks like, and just celebrate when you feel you got there, right? Like when you know that you got there, just sort of force yourself to celebrate that so that you feel that, okay, I I've done this, you know, I can check it out of my list. Um, so how, how do you deal with that, uh, Belinda, personally, with um, with sort of celebrating or, you know, getting getting to achieve or achieving your goals and kind of feeling that you're moving forward? How do you deal with that? Yeah, well, first off, that's definitely a great question, Alana, about the goals thing. And it sounds like you've achieved some of those goals. So yay, <laughs> congratulations. I definitely agree with you, Martina, that you should always take that moment to celebrate everything that you achieve. And I think we might be similar too, where we are big achievers. We are goal-driven and focused. And it can be very easy to uh, just blow past all your little milestones because as soon as you achieve that goal, you think, what well, next? Mm. That's kind of what happens to me. Going to freelance was a goal of mine. It wasn't always a goal, but once it became one, it was a very, you know, like dreamy kind of goal. And once I took that leap, my first, uh, my first thought was what next, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it was just so easy for me to um, keep going without taking that moment to celebrate. And what happened there is that I kind of blew past that milestone and I tried really hard Um, to, you know, launch my business and attract clients and do all this work for social media. And it was very easy for me to burn out. And I think, um, you know, once I reached that point, I was able to look back at that goal that I achieved. Mm. And even though I wasn't feeling as celebratory when it first happened, I was kind of able to celebrate it more um, in hindsight. So that was kind of a helpful moment for me to realize that Even if I don't feel the way I expect to when I achieve a goal, I should at least take a moment to recognize it. I even keep a running um, list in my notes app of just highlights of every month since, you know, uh, a month is a good chunk of time for me to just measure what have I achieved in that month for my mm -hmm. business that I can really celebrate. Um, how do so you do I that? Keep a how how does that. that look? Um, how does that look on your, like, do you write it down on your 
a journal or agenda or how do you do that? Yeah, so in a very simple way, because I don't always feel like I have enough time to do anything. So I was like, let's take the path of least resistance and open up my notes app on my iPhone. And, you know, as soon as a little goal is achieved and when I remember, I will take a moment to just write it down. So, you know, this month in May, my goal could be I'm on this podcast with Martina. That's a goal, um, a little milestone that's achieved that I should definitely celebrate. Um, or maybe, you know, you got hired by a really exciting client. I'll just write that down. Sometimes I even write down inquiries by really exciting clients that even if they fall through, I can celebrate the fact that they noticed my work. So just anything that made me even a little bit excited, I will write down as a highlight so that when I'm feeling, you know, and when I'm in one of those dips in your creative uh, pursuit or in your business, I can look at those and feel a little bit better about what I've accomplished. That's such a good advice. I think I think th sort of verbalizing what happens to us or the things we feel we achieve um, has such a great impact on the way we perceive um, our success. Um, I do something similar with my kids. Actually, every day we have, when, when, when we are at dinner, I ask them like, what was the best thing of the day? And, you know, every day that looks different. And um, it's actually nice to realize that or to go through the day and think like, hey, there were actually pretty cool things happening today. Um, so I think the same you can do with your business, Alana. Um, you know, like understanding or kind of um, putting a note on those things that happened to you that, you know, are kind of things you looked up to or you you work hard for, um, which, you know, at the end of the day, it's like it happened and perhaps it doesn't feel like a huge thing like you thought it would be. But understanding that it's actually an important step in your path and that, you know, all these little paths, it's, or these little steps is what they, what, you know, push you forward in what you're doing. Um, yeah. So, and I think, I think, Belinda, your idea of writing down these things is so important. You can always look back at this and kind of look back at your year or at your month and see like, hey, I've done pretty cool stuff, right? Yeah, definitely. And yeah. It, I, this kind of reminds me of the, um, the friends and community aspect as well. Mm. That's when you've got your support team too to yeah. just keep cheering you on. Because you know sometimes I might feel down about myself, and my friends who are following me along with my journey, mm -hmm. uh, who can also relate with me, they can say, "Actually, Belinda, this is a pretty good month for you. You know, you got this client project that you're working on, and you did these. Uh, you know, you you launched this newsletter, and you've been talking about it for half a year, and you finally did it. <laughs> so they're there to just remind you of some of those things, and also remind you of the time when you were really striving for that goal. Mm -hmm. You know, like past you, and they can say past you would have really celebrated. And I'm here to mm -hmm. remind you of that too. So yeah, and it's actually good to to keep on having goals you know I th this thing you were saying before that when you achieve one goal you're already looking for the next one right you're already working on the next one that's so common on us and because we are working on the next goal we don't celebrate the the one that is happening to us happening to us right now right but I think it's also good to know that we are we are having new goals that you know like you you are having always something to look um to look after or to look after or to look forward for. Um, so I think it's, that's also something to celebrate, not only the things you have achieved, but also the fact that you keep on having new ideas for your business, that you keep on having new ideas on how to develop your skills, on how to go on in your creative path. So thank you so much for sending those questions, Alana and Andrea. So now we are going to move on to a section in our show that is called the inspirational quote time because we all love quotes. And in this section, we do our best to answer questions from our listeners on social media with a quote. So that's a little bit of a challenge, Belinda. Um, we, let it, we later put these quotes or maxims on our show notes so that listeners can letter them and share them on social media. 
right? Um, Belinda, the truth, is, the truth is that here we will talk about it for a while. We will rumble around um, until <laughs> each one of us finds a, a quote or something that sounds like a quote. If you don't manage to, you know, put together a quote, don't worry. We will come up with a quote that sums up whatever you, you know, whatever answer you gave uh, in our conversation. Um, so here's the first question that is coming from Linda. So, so Linda is speaking about going freelance and she's asking, will I be able to ensure enough income? Right? Like the big question when you go uh, freelance, right? Um, you know, we all have the perception. I had a, I had a day job for a long time. Uh, you also, Belinda. I think we all... Basically, we all started there, right? Like getting a job somewhere and or working for a company. And at some point we realized like, hey, maybe if I go solo or, um, you know, if I go freelance, I could um, focus on just doing that one thing that I like. And we all have the perception that having a day job or being employed is the safe way. Um, but I think one of the biggest things that I have learned through this pandemic, um, I think me and everyone else, um, is that nothing is really set on stone. Nothing is really forever and nothing is really secure. I mean, how many people have you heard of, um, you know, that, that lost their job or were laid off, right, during the pandemic? Um, so when I read this question from Linda, um, one of the things that came up to my mind is that you know, when you're your own boss, you're kind of in charge of creating your own opportunities. So when the context is not, um, it's scary, you actually have the chance to pivot your business towards the places where the opportunities are pivoting as well, right? Uh, whereas when you are employed, um, you're kind of, you know, hanging from the you know, how the business is going for other people, right? So when you are, um, when you're the boss, when you're um, uh, running a freelance business, you sort of have this flexibility of understanding where possibilities are and kind of directing your business towards um, your, you know, the, the places where those possibilities are, opportunities are. How did that happen to you, Belinda? What, what, what happened to you with, um, during the pandemics and how how did you navigate it, this um, this context? Yeah, so that's definitely uh, the biggest concern, right? Is am I going to make enough in my freelance journey to uh, essentially make up for what you left? I think most of us, when we leave that job, we want we feel like we've reached this point of success when we can make at least the same amount that we made prior or at our old job or more right um and the beauty of freelance is that there isn't really as much of a cap to how much you can make compared to at your employer's place mm. um so for me i knew that when i left my job i wanted to have a sense of financial security so you know six to twelve months saved up for savings and covering our kids' healthcare and all that kind of stuff. Um, I have the fortunate um, system, support system of having my husband also contribute to our family finances. So, you know, we've got the, the um, double income coming into our family. Um, but yeah, there's, you know, I think one thing I realized is very quickly on is that even though client work was my biggest focus, it's very important to diversify your income for mm. cases when the pandemic happens, you know, and maybe client work isn't as um, coming in as much as it did before. What can you do in your business to kind of keep that finance going? Um, so I didn't have anything set up prior to the pandemic since I was just, you know, launching my business and mm. starting to figure out what sort of streams of income I want to create. Um, so now I'm in the process of building up more of my passive income streams. So creating, you know, educational materials and um, potentially some digital products. That's kind of my next step. And then I'll slowly build up to, you know, more as I go. But yeah, that was definitely a worry in the beginning. And I think if you have a bit of that security and having your savings set before you take that leap, you will feel less scared and also still have the luxury of saying no to opportunities mm. if you know it's not aligned to your goals and not feeling like you have to say yes because you need it for the finances. 
Yeah, and that's so important also to have that, you know, you're sort of starting your freelance business not only because you want some sort of um, autonomy in your life and you want more freedom to decide on different aspects of your life, but also because you want to be doing work that aligns with you, right? And aligns with your values and what you want to do, right? So having that, um, having also the chance to choose the work you want to, um, you want to do um, is also something you will be aiming for, right? When you start your freelance business. And I think it's, it's important what you just mentioned that um, you know, for you, um, starting your freelance business um, with the right food meant also to, um, is this something you say in English, like starting with the right food or? Yes. Okay. I'm good. also very bad at idioms like that. I usually mess those up too. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Okay. I think that's correct though. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I guess that, you know, starting uh, your business um, on the right food was meant for you also to have certain security or have savings for a certain amount of time that will cover certain expenses that you have and your kids uh, health care so i think in your case linda i will ask myself first what what would make me feel secure and you know how much do you need to have in your bank account is that you know is that your savings in your bank account that makes you feel secure? Is that you ask for support from your um, uh, partners or your family? Um, what will make you feel secure in terms of like, you know, covering up for your expenses, for your expenses and being able to finally give this, um, make this step in your life, right? So this might look different in you as it does in Linda. Um, if you have children, if you have a mortgage, uh, that, that all, sums up on the you know how that looks for you but definitely define how that looks for you and once you have that defined try to work towards that goal first to cover up those um to reach that goal of covering up your expenses and feeling secure to give that uh, that first step and after that you just need to set up a deadline for yourself and um yeah and try to make it happen right so I wrote a, a quote for you um, right here um, that is no one can take care of, sorry, again, no one can take care of you better than yourself, right? Um, or no one can take care of you better than you yourself, right? So um, the opportunity of starting a freelance business is that you will always um, strive for success. You will always try to find opportunities for you to continue doing business, right? Whereas when you are employed or you are working on a day job, this doesn't really depend on you. Although it might feel like this, it might feel like a secure um, place to be. Um, the truth is that the decision is not in your hands. Whereas with a freelance business, the decision is much more in your hands and you can navigate the context with much more freedom than when you are um, employed, right? What would be your quote for that, um, Linda? We didn't put a quote together for you. <laughs> You can that take your time. We can, question. <laughs> we can we can just think of a quote for the for the next question. I have another question here from um, Julian that is also related to um, to that to securing kind of um, to providing for for the family. Julian is asking how to take to take care for a family with two kids when starting, right? Um, and it's a tough question. I can totally relate to that feeling, right? Especially because I also have two kids. Uh, you, Belinda, you also have two kids. How old are your kids? I have two girls. They are six and three. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. 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 Um, so kind of like my kids, my, mine are two and five. So yeah. Two and five. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Busy, busy. Very <laughs> so, busy. Yeah. Um, so I think, I mean, I, at this point in my life, I think it, this is one of the first things that come to mind when, um, when, you know, when there's a change in context, like this is, this is the first thing that came to my mind when, uh, when the pandemic hit here in Germany, um, I would say that and my team, those were the first things I thought of when that happened and like kind of thinking like, okay. How am I gonna provide for 
for all, for all these people, right? And I can totally understand that, Julian, um, you are actually, you know, asking yourself, okay, I want to go freelance, I want to start a business, but then how I am I able, am I going to be able to, um, to provide for my family, right? So in your case, Belinda, what, what, what would you... What would you suggest, um, Julian, um, when he's thinking of going solo, but he's also worried about like, um, yeah, how am I going to pay for, um, mm -hmm. you know, daycare and health care for my children and all the expenses that we build up, you know, through having a family, right, that, that, that adds up really fast. Um, so how am I going to navigate that situation on top of like, you know, kind of the stress of, of starting your own freelance business, right? Yeah, that is something I'm definitely still figuring out myself. Mm -hmm. And it's a big question that I constantly am faced with, especially when the pandemic happened, is how can I, you know, nurture this new business, which almost feels mm -hmm. like another baby, mm -hmm. um, but maybe not as cute and, you know, won't hug you back, but still it requires a lot of attention and nurturing. <laughs> Um, and also be there for my kids and also be able to provide for them financially. You know, there's all these different options that you have that you're faced with. Like for me, you know, leaving my job meant that we would have to look for an alternative um, way to get health care because we were getting health care through my job. And then also daycare coverage. Uh, our, um, our older child goes to a private school that we have to pay for as well. And that's another expense. How do you do all these things and then also have to put all this extra time in to nurturing a new business? But then, you know, a good chunk of your time is also being spent with your kids, too. So that is a constant juggle that I'm I feel like I'm still facing. And, um, you know, my first year, it was going fairly well with the situation that we had set up. And I think it was because we had that little transition period of me working four days a week at my job to still bring in the you know income as I was building up my freelance. So that helped a lot to have, you know, that um, share, like I have my financial support, but I could also focus more of my efforts on my business at that time without worrying too much about making all this money because I had a full-time job to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And then once I finally took that leap, my kids were at daycare and school, so I would use that time during the day to build up my business and, you know, um, work on client projects and things like that. And then when the pandemic happened, it was flip flopped where I was taking on the full time childcare at that point. Mm. And my husband was um, bearing the brunt of the financial support for our family as I was trying to figure out another way to bring in income. So that's kind of where I am right now is mm. figuring out, you know, my passive income and taking all the work to build it, which again, I hate the word passive income because it just doesn't seem to reflect what you do, yeah. <laughs> the work up front. Yeah. So I'm, I'm putting a lot of work up front to build that so that it can give me a little bit more flexibility with my kids later on. I'm not, you know, constantly setting aside um, chunks of my day working on client projects. Mm. I think you touched on so many things that um, Julian here ha can have into account, right? Because, um, First, you touched on um, income streams, right? When, when, when I remember when I started, I first started freelancing, or I first thought of the idea of starting freelancing. Um, I always had my head fixated in uh, client work, right? I so I my my questions were all around like, how do I find clients? Um, how do I start conversations with potential clients? How do I start, um, you know, expanding my network? And actually, I think Belinda, this is so important as a, you know, as a freelancer to start thinking not only of, you know, how to find clients or how can you generate income through client work, but also how can you generate income through different income streams? So I always, I always, speak about the concept not of like finding clients but finding like opportunities to generate income right which could have different shapes could have the shape of uh, client work could have the shape of of uh, physical products that you sell in your shop could have the shape of um, digital products that you say uh, you sell or could have the shape of uh, online classes could have a lot of different shapes right um, this is something that I 
that I realized as, as I was running my business, I started like having ideas on like, hey, I can offer a workshop. And suddenly that workshop was successful and it became eventually one of my income streams. Then I like wrote a book about like my um, sort of my technique to to teach lettering. And then that became also another income stream. Right. And then suddenly the thing you do or that thing you're you know, um, your expert ad becomes a lot of different things you can do, right? So with that thing you do or that thing you're really good at, you start finding different ways of generating income. And I think that for someone who has a family like Julian um, and is wondering like, hey, how can I generate um, income to provide for my family? Perhaps you can already start thinking like, how many different things I can do that non, are not necessarily client work, right? Where you sort of exchange time for money. Which other things can I do that sort of create that income that I need to provide for my family um, and uh, sort of help me get rid of this idea of like having a fixed income every month, right? Um so I think I, you could start there, Julian, um, just as a, as a way of exploring different things you could do, um, because also you will, you will start noticing that there's a lot of other things you can do with your skills, which are not necessarily client work, right? Um, so I always say that, and I have a little quote for you in this case, is that a sustainable freelance business is built around you and your happiness. So with that, you know, with that image or with that dream that you have of how that freelance business should look like, um, how can you build a business that allows you to achieve that freedom, achieve that autonomy that you want to achieve, and also achieve that income goal that will provide for your family and make you and your family happy right so i think a lot of a lot of building a freelance business goes around finding what is enough for you what makes you happy what provides for the people around you right um so yeah, I, you could start there. Um, so just going back to the question, how to take care for a family with two kids when starting. Um, it's just, I would, I would start there just to um, figuring out which, how many ways do you have to generate income for you and your business and to provide for your family. Um, you might have much more options that you think you have right now. Um, so in your case, Belinda, just to, to sort of sum up this idea of different income streams, um, how would you say that it would be a good way or which, what is your process at finding those income streams for yourself? Where, where did you start it or where, where are you starting right now? Because you said that you mentioned that you are right now in the process of creating those different income streams. How did you identify what could be a potential income stream for you? Um, I basically started to realize that I could offer resources to uh, people who are following me in my audience because I was starting to get the same questions from them. So a lot of it was asking me about how, you know, my process behind some of the artwork that I'm doing. So I'm thinking, oh, there's ways that I can share about that. Um, and then also when you have uh, all these responsibilities that you're juggling between being a mom and having another job at the time and freelancing, how do you juggle all of that? So there are different strategies that I use that help me to stay sane while doing all of that. And now I can start sharing that back. So, um, and you know, some of it was even as small as like finding different shortcuts to work faster. So Procreate Tips is something that I've been generating out pretty quickly because they're kind of, um, I've already learned them all, like the ones that work really well. So I'm starting to share those more. Mm -hmm. So that's just some of the ways that have been working for me is people who are asking me the same questions over and over again, and I'm starting to consolidate my information in that way. And then um, another one is just, you know, I, I'm hoping to eventually work towards online courses. And mm -hmm. that's just bringing in 
the, you know, the teaching background that I have and applying my skill in that way. I know you had mentioned earlier on if I like found that these there were connections in my career changes. And at the time I would say no, but I hope that there would be. <laughs> and then now at this point, I'm like thinking there are some connections and skills that I can bring in from my background um, that I wouldn't have had had I not gone through that you know, strange route that I took. So I'm hoping to apply my teaching skill as well, eventually. That's great. So I think I find that so interesting that you actually touched on, or you actually ask your audience what, what they were interested um, about, like what they wanted to learn from you, or you actually consolidated, you mentioned you consolidated information or recurrent questions into resources that then you offer to your audience um and i'm gonna add a link to in the show notes to those i think you have a lot of resources on your website so i'm gonna add those um those resources to the show notes so that everyone can um can understand how belinda is doing it and perhaps you can also like follow the same the same steps toward creating uh, those um those income streams for yourself so i think that's so interesting right because some, oftentimes we we sort of try to figure out everything on our own, right? And yeah. I think it's something so important from what we were discussing um, today. Like we were, you know, we were discussing about, about a lot of things. I have a lot of notes here. Um, you know, when you're going, like when you're starting your freelance business, um, you will want to focus on possibility and what is there for you that will enable you to have a better life and to have more autonomy. Um, we often, we, we said before that we often focus on the lack side of things, like what could go wrong, you know, if what if I don't make enough money, but what if you do make enough money? What if you do make more money than you're actually doing right now? What if you have more time for yourself and for your family? Um, so, and you mentioned before that it was very important for you to surround yourself with people who would cheer you on and kind of uh, mirror the things that, um, that are good about you and kind of, you know, support you throughout this, um, this path, right? Support you in your career change and support you in this idea of like going solo with your business. And mm -hmm. I think also something so intelligent from you was that you were not just trying to start everything from zero. You were actually touching on the resources that you already had. Um, so I think this is very eye opening for some of those that are listening right now and are thinking of going solo and I thinking like, oh my God, I have to start over again. I don't have clients. I don't have a network. And what Belinda did actually is to ask her employer and, and um, you know, look for the opportunities that were already there and ask for, you know, you might ask your employer if they will take you as a freelancer, um, as a full-time freelancer, or if they will be willing to have you three times a week instead of five days a week, right? So try to find in those people that are already around you, try to find opportunities for you. Those are Perhaps those are, you know, your employer and your previous employers and your friends and family will be probably your first clients and will be um, instrumental in like setting up your freelance business. Um, and lastly, many were asking or some were asking about um, the security side of um, going freelance, right? And um, you, Belinda, I think you gave like a very, um, like a very easy framework in in that terms that in those terms that is like define for yourself what will make you feel secure um, to give that step, right? What, how does that look for you? Is that six um, six months of savings in the bank? Uh, is that just covering up for your children, uh, healthcare? How does that look for you? And once you have achieved that, then you know that you can give that step um, feeling a lot more secure, right? And not feeling that you have to generate income right away. Lastly, when you are thinking of going freelance, try to think of 
the different ways to you have to generate income instead of focusing only on client work, right? Um, so try to think of what can you do with that you are really great at? Um, how many different things you can do with that um, and how many different income streams you can have for your business so that you don't depend on client work only, right? Um, did I touch on any, on all of the points? Did I miss anything, Belinda, about this? Pretty much everything. I mean, it, it's, you know, to summarize for me, it's don't be afraid to ask and try different ways of getting your business to work. There are so many different possibilities. And like you had mentioned before, I also felt like when I thought about freelance and full-time job, it was very black and white, but there's this beautiful like rainbow gradient or grayscale or whatever, you know, there's so many possibilities of how you can get your business to launch and also succeed at it. Um, and continue to bring in those finances for yourself and your family, you know, for your living. Um, and then also, you know, if fear is the biggest thing that is holding you back, that was the big thing that was holding me back. But now I'm seeing that at every step of the way, when I had that big fear that I had to face with my career changes, it was essentially a sign of an exciting change that was going to happen. As long as I was willing to embrace that fear and to know that no matter what, it's going to be an experience that you're learning from. Whether or not you succeed succeed in your terms or not, you are going to still learn from it. And there's so much uh, value in that kind of experience. I love what you said. Em embrace that fear. I love that. <laughs> yeah, because that fear is what actually brings you forward, right? Once you overcome yeah. that, um, then it, 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 it's definitely... Uh, worth it um, so now we are moving on to like the last section of the show which is um, better now um, this is where we share something we are happy about or something that has changed our lives lately and that might help our listeners so it could be something really simple like I bought this cream that is perfect for my skin I, you know or it could be something really transcendental so Belinda something that has changed your life lately Uh, could be also a series that you watch on Netflix or, you know. <laughs> oh, man, let me think about that. Something that has changed my life lately. Um, I have been, I'm always kind of on the hunt for the best things that you can binge watch, but also multitask with, mm -hmm. which to me feels like, well, one thing, it rules out any kind of um, like movie or TV show that's in a foreign language. I used to really like watching Korean dramas, but I can't watch them anymore because I can't draw and understand what's happening without reading the subtitles. But um, I did finish watching um, Shadow and Bone recently, which is this fantasy series. And that's um, tied to my love for fantasy and like reading books about it and stuff too. So um, that's something that I did recently that has kind of brought me joy. And I, in a way it kind of, refuels my creative juices too even though i'm not necessarily drawing fantasy although i do want to figure out if there's a way to do that um, it helps to inspire me by just you know using getting one part of my brain really excited about binge watching something and then inspiring me to you know create afterwards so, amazing great i love yeah. that um on my side i can just share that i joined a group like a mastermind group and um You know, it's been so great because I felt really as isolated in this thing of like running a business and stuff. And, um, you know, I realized like it's interesting because we were speaking about this um, on, on, you know, throughout our conversation, like how important it is to surround yourself with people that are, you know, going through the same challenges and, you know, feeling the th same things that are, you're feeling kind of. And I feel that I found like a, a little community of ladies that are crazy about their businesses like I am and they are cheering me on sometimes we even cry on our group calls and it's such a great like way of like you know sharing the journey with someone so I will totally like um, reiterate on that on that thing like how important it is to surround yourself with people that are like-minded and are going through similar challenges that you're going through and that really cheer you on instead of like keeping you back. 
So I would totally recommend that for everyone. It has, it is working wonders with me. And um, I think uh, Belinda, as you said before, it did, it was really instrumental in, in starting your own freelance business or changing career paths. Um, mm -hmm. So we should keep that in mind. Um, so it was such an honor to have you, Belinda. It was such a good conversation. It just flew. The time really flew. Um, yeah. So where can people find you if they want to find you on social media, on the internet? You can find me as at Belinda S. Co. Uh, people ask me, the S is for my middle initial. It just it hasn't been taken if I do Belinda S. Co. Pretty much everywhere on the internet. Um, I am most active on Instagram and TikTok. And if you want to head to my website, BelindaSCo.com, I do have a free download for freelance, uh, getting started in freelance um, that you can access as well as my blog for more resources. Um, but those are the three places that I am most active. Amazing. We're, we're going to add those to the show notes. Um, it was great to have you. Um, so you can find me, the host of this show, uh, on social networks as, as well, at Martina Flor on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. If you have a question or a comment, you can go to martinaflor.com slash podcast, where you can see previous episodes. Uh, you can find the show notes and, say in, uh, and send your voice memos with your comments and questions. Um, you can find these episodes and comment on them on my YouTube channel. So if you go to martinaflor.com slash YouTube, it will redirect you to the um, YouTube channel. Um, so this is it for today. If you love this episode, subscribe to the, this podcast. And if you leave us a review, it will help others find us. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Belinda, for being there. And see you on, yeah, and see you on the next episode of uh, Letter Now.